can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Brad Martineau. He he is the co-founder of Sixth Division. Um, And Brad, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And I had on uh, Ian Garlic. Uh, Ian, actually, I've known about you and the company for a decade now, but he formally introduced us and uh, he runs Video Case Story. So... Um, you can check out videocastory.com. He talked about uh, Brad actually is interesting, how he runs his agency, what's good with a customer success story, and also how his dad had live dolphins. His dad was an entrepreneur in a, a restaurant, and they had live dolphins in the restaurant. Now, you'd think the live the uh, restaurant was in Florida. It was in Wisconsin. So that was, not only is that abnormal, but that's abnormal for Wisconsin. But there were just some creative ideas from an entrepreneurship uh, perspective there. Uh, Jason Swank was another one. I had him on twice. Um, Brad knows Jason. Uh, He uh, built up and grew his agency to over eight figures and sold it. And then he uh, then talked about how he's been buying up agencies and talked about valuation and just really good conversation about running a business. So check out those on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. You know, Brad, we call ourselves kind of the magic elves that make it look easy for the host and the company so they could run their business and also just build amazing relationships and create great great content. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com, email us at support at rise25.com. And I, Brad, I joke around and say, almost everything in my life that's good tracks back to a podcast. And I did not meet my wife on a podcast, so that's the only exception. (laughs) But Brad and I originally met from a distance because I was working with Mixergy and Andrew Warner. And we, at the time, this was maybe over a decade ago, I don't know, was he was contemplating, what do I do? How do I systematize? And really what I'll formally say it in a second, but Brad and his company are experts at the client journey and automation. And Brian, and, and Andrew was looking at getting help with that. So he flew to Brad and his company to get help with that. And um, I remember that. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. But but Brad is a co-founder, as I mentioned, CEO of Sixth Division, and they help entrepreneurs launch automatic client journeys. And they help them leverage marketing automation to make it easier because there's so many things to manage uh, with the business. There's so many aspects of that business. So that entrepreneur can feel in control of their business and produce better results. And most importantly, he's a basketball coach. Right. So, um, Brad, thanks for joining me. Uh, Thank you. Excited to be here. Excited to be here. So just talk about Sixth Division for a second and what you do. And I don't know if you remember that when Andrew Warner came and if that has relevance to this to this journey. Uh, I do. Yeah. So quick, very, very quick. uh, I I believe one of the phrases I picked up that I love from uh, from Frank Kern is a a mercifully short uh, introduction. (laughs) Uh, but so Sixth Division was born out of the I was the sixth employee at uh, at Infusionsoft, which is now called Keep. And they're one of the automation tools that exist out in the world today. Uh, and I was there for about eight years or so. And one of the two questions I heard over and over and over and over again while I was there is what are other people doing that works? And then number two is how do I do it? Like, how do I do it faster? How do I implement it? And those are the two hurdles that every entrepreneur uh, is always wondering. It's like, what should I do in my business? And then how do I get it implemented faster? And with the advent of, you know, Infusionsoft, now Keep started it. There are a lot of other tools now that allow you to do, everyone calls it automation, client journey automation, whatever. Um, The advent of that is like, oh, I can make my business run like a well-oiled machine. Uh, The challenge is, is that there's no school, there's no class, there's no curriculum for how to actually organize all the different things you could do, decide what you ought to do, then create a plan, and then actually go get it implemented. And so it ends up creating a lot of headache and nightmare. So 
Six Division was born out of when I um, when I left Infusionsoft. Uh, and I like to say I got fired. I really just got laid off as part of a round of layoffs. But saying I got fired is, makes it way more dramatic. Um, I looked around. I'm like, well, I know this really well. There were really no other competitors outside of that particular tool at the time. I'm like, I'm going to create a company that makes it easy for people to use this automation. Uh, in fact, I still have my initial like mission statement document that I made at the time. And it was to demystify what it takes to use Infusionsoft. And over time, that has evolved to demystify what it takes to automate your client journey, um, regardless of what tool you use, because there's plenty of tools that are great, depending on what market you're in. Um, and no matter what tool you use, you're still going to face the same thing. There's a, an unlimited number of ideas that every guru has that's going to tell you what you should do. And you have to be able to take all those ideas, filter through them, and then create a plan of how you're going to implement it, and then actually go implement it in a way where you're not leaving this like deck of cards that would fall apart if one person changes one thing. Um, and also it's got to be organized where if somebody leaves, you can bring somebody else in and it's not going to take eight years for them to figure out what the heck the other person built when they were there. Uh, so we are in the world of just, just like you read, uh, helping people launch automatic client journeys. And the reason why we call them automatic client journeys, and we don't say we're in the world of client journey automation is because the goal, the outcome is to have a client journey that goes from eyeball to hand raise to sales conversation or sales environment to giving money to smiles and being happy. Uh, and whatever you want to have happen, it happens like clockwork. So it's automatic. Some of that may be automated, but some of it might require a human. So what we're looking for is an automatic client journey. Every step that I want to have, it's going to happen regardless of whether a human does it or whether software can just pull it off uh, and actually automate it. So uh, you know, we've been around, we've worked with a lot of people, we've we've ridden the wave of the agency, and we've learned, uh, you know, lots of lessons as a result of my own stupidity, and we've gotten better. And, uh, and here we are today, um, really, really trying to figure out, continue to try to figure out, like, how can we continue to simplify, we exist to simplify what it takes to leverage tools and software to build and deliver a better client journey, so you can get more clients, make them happier, while simultaneously making you and your team's life easier. So like, that's like the mission of, hey, there's gotta be even a better way to do it. So that's what we beat our heads on against the, you know, we beat our heads on every day to try and make that better and better and better. Fred, I wanna ask, uh, I wanna have you walk through what you did with a dentist because it's very instructive on, it's a service professional, but also they used it beyond their dental practice. But before we get there, you, messaged, uh, you mentioned lessons of stupidity. So I have to ask, what were some of those lessons oh, of stupidity? Bro, that, that's like that's like a whole different podcast episode. So it's it's this it's the same lessons of stupidity that everybody has when they run a business. And I think we mentioned before, uh, came up when we were talking before Alex Ramosi, and he's got um, one of his you know tweet thread, Facebook, Instagram, wherever all the places that gets uh, reels that it gets posted. Um, he's got one that says. Uh, entrepreneurship in life, something to the tune of entrepreneurship in life is a never ending exercise of figuring it out. So it basically it's like, so stop feeling bad because you don't have it figured out. Like that is life is the figuring of it out. Um, and so, I mean, I could go, I could go on and on from, uh, I could go on and on like the wrong, the wrong business model, um, or trying to scale a business model beyond how far it could actually go to, uh, the way that you set expectations for team members to, uh, how you price things like it's I, I tell if you're on any if you're ever a client of mine and you're on any of our calls, you'll hear me say this all the time. I'll say one of two things. Um, I'll remind you that any good idea I have is only because I've done it wrong at least three times. And so that's where it comes from, because I've made all the stupid mistakes that we all make. Like, oh, and in hindsight, it's always like, well, that was really dumb. I think I think and obviously hindsight is always 2020. Um, uh, also, I'll either say that or I'll say, ask me how I know. So anytime you give me advice, like, ask me how I know. And then today, actually, I had a call with clients. And right before this one, I said, ask me how I know. And I said, actually, don't, because I'm not really in the mood to relive painful memories today. So uh, this just lots of lessons of things that, you know, when you're when you're uh, when you're trying to grow, it means you're trying to go into a place where you've never been before, uh, which means you have to make decisions. So, you know, behind me, I've got this is my mantra. It's on my hat to uh, dollar, which is decide, act, learn, repeat. This came out of the fact that I used to feel uh, embarrassed or ashamed of like, how did I not get everything perfect from the beginning? And then I'm like, well, no, that's not actually the process of life. The process of life and the process of progress is decide, take action, and then stop and pay attention. And if you screwed up, and then you repeat, and then you make a new decision based on what you learned, and you'll get to success faster, the faster you can go through this cycle, rather than sitting around and trying to guess 
uh, you know, what the best answer is. So I say that half jokingly, but if we really wanted to, we could dive into, I could give you lots of lessons of stupidity. Um, what are, are, what's the top one that sticks out to you? Um, the, the top one that sticks out would have to be, so there are two that come to mind immediately as the biggest ones that, that had, I was, let's just call it the biggest, uh, impact. Um, and, uh, the, the first one, the foundational one is how long it took for me to actually sit down and, and with practicality and clarity define what I actually wanted and then require that the business and everything else aligns to it. And there's two pieces. One is you actually, it takes courage for you to declare out loud what you want. Um, Courage that you could actually go get it. And then also courage that you don't care what somebody else says about it. I actually think the biggest amount of pressure we have when we're going to decide what we want is not, is it enough? It's um, actually, sorry. It's actually what people will think that we're actually setting the bar too low. Like we're not really comfortable just saying, you know what, if I made a half a million dollars or $250,000 a year or a hundred... $50,000, $50,000, whatever. It's like, if I made that for the rest of my life and I could work this number of hours or whatever, like that would work for me because what I really care about is whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. And we allow ourselves because of the way the gurus talk and the the grind culture and whatever. It's like, well, that I can't do that. Now I feel like a cop out or whatever. It's like, no, I'm really clear that like for me, I'm really clear that I, I don't, I get into the office about 10 because I'm up at six, sometimes five uh, playing basketball. And then I go coach basketball. And that is a piece that I'm committed to. And I will sacrifice the eight figures of income, the multiple seven figures of income, the whatever, like I'm okay with it because I'm really clear where uh, I'm really clear how much I actually need to not need to survive, but need to live the life that I want. And I just, so it took me, it took me a while to get to that point. Uh, one, because I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed to admit that the number was lower than like a really sexy number that you would post on social media. And I didn't understand that just because I said that's the bare minimum um, or or like I'd be fine at that level. I I was um doesn't mean you can't grow beyond that. Exactly. Level. That that yeah. was the other piece. It does it doesn't actually, it's yeah. not a ceiling. Because I've like, heard people on the show, Brad, like exactly that. Like they initially go, I'd be happy if I was replaced my salary for fifty thousand dollars. And then they get to that point and they're like, hmm. What's next? What's next? So it doesn't, and, like you're saying, doesn't limit it. Right. So, um, and then, so yeah, so that, and then the other, the other thing that led to that challenge for me was that there was no, I, I wasn't aware of any like tactical uh, or like practical tool to capture it. So we, we created one, it's called the return document. It's the thing I start with, with every client. They're like, Hey, what should I do here, here, here? I'm like, I don't know. What are you trying to make happen? And essentially it defines it defines your return in the three currencies. I believe there's only three currencies that we have to spend and we're only trying to get three currencies. And I believe it's in this order, time, energy, and money. So time, how much time do I want to be spending in the business? Energy has to do with what's my role. Uh, what am I, when I, so when I'm spending that time, what am I spending it on? And the last one is how much, how much money and you're defining, uh, you're defining a floor, not a ceiling, which goes to your point of you just, you set the number. And I look at it through the lens of if I would like right now, if I could picture a future, I, I hit this time, this type of role, and this amount of money, and I could ride that for 30 years, would I be good with it? Now, I'm probably not going to be good with it for 30 years. But um, but when I define that, all of a sudden, this is what happens only, only like 99% of the time when we get entrepreneurs to define it is they're like, oh, I'm way closer than I thought I was. I'm like, you're welcome. Now you can ditch all the head trash you had about how far behind you were. So. Uh, that would be the first one is just it took way too long um, because I was embarrassed of how small it was to start. Like I was just embarrassed of like, oh, it's, I'd be content at $100,000 or whatever it was. Um, and then but once once and I I still remember the day I was on a walk, uh, just like thinking through in my head and I actually said it out loud to myself. And I don't remember what the uh, the number is irrelevant. I don't remember what the numbers were, what the hours were or whatever. It was like, no, this is what I actually want to do. And saying it out loud, there was like, oh, and I don't, I actually don't feel ashamed. I'll go into any meeting with a bunch of people that have like eight figure businesses that are talking about their multi seven figure incomes and be like, no, like, I'm not, I'm not preaching that you're wrong at all. And I'm really comfortable that this is what I want. And I'm totally content with it. And in the amount of time that I work, I'm going to try and make as much money as I can. So that was like, that was liberating. So that was one, uh, one big mistake. And then every time I get away from it, 
it's that's the mistake that we relearn again. It's like, oh, wait, I need to go back to this and remind myself I'm not actually behind just because I started to listen to podcasts and got excited about what I might be able to do. Let me just come back to and that honestly, for me, it's probably once a quarter. I have to go and I rewrite it all out, actually regenerate it all so I can get. I think I'm a slow learner, too. I think I'm a slow I, learner. It's, mine is probably once a week. A little, once yeah. a quarter. Well, I might yeah. and I might act, I might be doing a little bit if I want to make myself look better. But it's it, it's. It is way more frequent than people will want to admit publicly that it's yeah. like, okay, let me go rewrite. No, I'm fine with this many hours. I'm fine doing this type of a job and I'm fine with this much money. And if I can get more, then I'll be happy for it. But I'm not going to yeah. let that slip into an expectation that is now is now the requirement for me to be happy. So that's number one. Uh, the other one I'll make much shorter because this was going to be sort of a tangent before we got into the dentist. But um, the other Keep one- Keep going. Keep going. The other one was in the leading of my team. Uh, and this, there were, there were three cycles of this. One of them was healthy. Two were unhealthy. We have, I, I call them the exodus. There have been three exoduses where we basically had to recycle our entire team. The first one was very healthy because the team we had was a bunch of they were great people, but part-time and not really committed to what we were doing. And that was when we were trying to figure out like this, like this sixth division even exists. What are we going to do? And we had a moment that like put us on the map early on. Um, and it's like, okay, this is going to be a thing. And then we realized like, we can't like, this is a thing. We're going to be a business. There's, there's something here, but I need people that are like, this is what they're doing. Not I'm, I'm trying to like contend with the other thing you have going on, which again, not, none of it's a bad thing, but it's like, just decide which one is most important. So we did that exodus, but then in my attempt to be a leader and my attempt to get people excited, I, I, I created visions that while they were possible, I didn't like visions of how um, of how our team could be successful. So one of our a part of our mission statement or like one of the things that we really believe in is uh, we exist to help entrepreneurs build the businesses that they want so they can enjoy life as they see fit. That includes us. And when it says us, it's not just me and my business partner. It's actually all of our team members. Like I don't I don't believe in the business where I create one where my life is great and I'm doing it on the backs of 10 or 15 or 20 or 50 or five or one other person where their life sucks so mine can be great. Like, no, the whole thing's got to work where everybody's um, job and schedule is like reasonable. So um, so I created visions of how we could make their lives great. But then what I didn't do is I didn't expose to them or just demonstrate to them uh, the work that it would take to actually make that happen. And I didn't show them and require that they actually do the work. So I tried to take the responsibility on after casting this vision and if anybody has kids or has employees or has whatever, and you try to do this, I'm telling you right now, what you're going to create is you're going to create entitlement and resentment and not, not negative intentional entitlement. You just created a vision of how cool it would be. You got them all excited. And then you did nothing to tell them that they were not doing what they need to do to earn it. So they assume that it should be there. And so you create resentment in them when they don't get it and they get really frustrated and then they leave. And that happened. We had a whole exodus. And then we did it again. And then I was like, oh, hey, I should probably figure out the numbers and how this is actually going to work. And then just be like, yo, here's how you get paid. If you can produce this way, then we can make that happen. And if not, then you need to get better. So that would be the other the other big one was um, not realizing that leadership is more about casting a vision of the outcome and the work and then requiring that they do the work so that they can earn the outcome. You're not a great leader just because you can get people excited about something and then you can do the work to actually make it happen for them. And the other thing, by the way, is it'll create resentment in you because you'll get frustrated because you're doing a bunch of work and you're not actually getting any more benefit. You're actually just doing the work for them and you're doing your own work. So those would be the two, those would be two big ones. Brad, I love it. I think you have a book in you there with like the uh, 12 biggest mistakes you made and uh, <laughs> mapping them out. That's really interesting. And I don't know if, if you're watching, listening to the audio, you can see I have sixth division website pulled up. And um, I thought this was, you know, right now we're looking at the code of the Sixers, right? Yep. And you have um, six core values, and each of them are a quote from from someone. Um, yep. Which which one? Uh, I want to talk about uh, one of these. Which one should we highlight here? Well, we already talked about the first one in my first problem of not knowing what I wanted to accomplish. So we can skip that one. Uh, we kind of talked to. Uh, so if you're listening um, and not looking, we have know where you're going, do the work, figure it out, create awesome, improve your awesome, and be a so force we gotta of talk nature. About, we got to talk about be a force of nature, which is, if you're watching, it's over on this other side behind me. 
uh, because dollar really embodies uh, do the work, figure it out, create awesome, improve your awesome. That really embodies those four values. Uh, and then the first one is like, like, what are you actually doing? You've got to know where you're going. And then to be a force of nature, I think is is um, it's it's one of my favorite ones. That's why I have it up behind me uh, here because it it forces you to really really live in the gap between like the quote that goes with it. I love is like, how do how do I be bold but not bully? Um, and Jim Rohn, I, you have on here. Yeah, yeah, the challenge of leadership is to be strong but not rude. Be kind but not weak. Be bold but not bully. Be thoughtful but not lazy. Be humble but not timid, be proud, but not arrogant. Yeah. So how do I live in that gap? And anyone that's actually trying to be a leader, again, I don't care if you're married, just married. I don't care if you're married and have kids. I don't care if you're, if you're running a company and you've got employees or whatever, that is the challenge. How do I have the conversation with this person that is like, Hey, that's not acceptable or you didn't earn this, but how do I do it in a way where I don't come? Like, I'm not, I'm not being a prick. Um, I've got to help them see a better outcome. Like that is the, that is the challenge. Um, and so that one I love because that's a constant cycle that's going on in my head is I, I can't be weak, but I also, I also can't be timid. Like we're not, we're not going to go anywhere. And I've, I've, I've lived, I've lived all of those on the wrong side of every single one of them. Um, so that, that's, that's one of my favorites to really explore how you create a culture and, 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 uh, and an understanding within your team and within your, uh, organization to where, um, everyone's one aware of that challenge that exists because we're humans. And then you start to create some agreements about how you're going to operate uh, so that nobody has to worry about it. Like, I don't have to worry about whether you're going to interpret my being bold as me being a bully or my being strong as me being rude. It's like, no, we can take all the extra, you know, gaming out of it or whatever term you'd put on. We'll take it all out. And it's like, no, if I say something, you know that I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be uh, a jerk. I'm not trying to be any of those things. It's just something that I see. And it's real simple. Either it's true or it's not. And so either acknowledge that it's true and you might need to change something and that's fine. So then you don't need to be defensive about it or acknowledge that I don't have all the information and tell me, and then I don't have to try to defend what I said initially because I didn't have all the information. So it's like you take all that out of the equation and you create a really, really cool environment to work in. Thanks for sharing that, Brad. Thanks for yeah. going on. I don't consider it a tangent at all, but <laughs> um, those stories, it's really instructive. Um, so talk about the dentist. For a second. Okay. What did you do with the dentist? Um, as you're talking about that, I'm gonna pull this up. You can see um I'm at sixth division. You could see um who they've helped. And what's cool about this, Brad, I was telling you before you hit record, I was trying to get to the bottom of this page just to see who else they have. And I it I just gave up. Like I was just like, there's too many yeah, it it success story like videos. <laughs> there, there's a lot of them, it's on purpose. It's like, oh, okay, there's a bunch of them. I get it. They've worked with a bunch of people. Um, which, which we have, you know, all different, all different levels, but so, so the dentist, the dentist is a really interesting one because I feel like it's, um, it's a great, it's a great example for almost anyone that does like uh, professional services or some sort of service or something where you're going to meet with somebody before they actually really officially become a client. You've got to then convince them to want to become a client. Uh, and, and then you got to set up expectations and have them be happy and excited. Uh, and the other thing I love about the dentist one is, um, there's nobody on the planet, unless you're in excruciating pain, who wants to go to the dentist. So it's a great, like all the like, oh, but what I do is whatever. It's like, bro, you ain't got nothing on a dentist. So um, so with the dentist, they had like their normal, you know, family dental practice or whatever. And they also did, uh, he had a, a part of his, his um, business that was doing just like high end, like elective procedures, uh, cosmetic dentistry type stuff. And, um, and the the first time that he would meet people uh, usually is like in the office, like you meet the dentist in the office and the dentist is like putting fingers in your mouth or whatever. Like, no, it's like, that's, that's the least exciting way to meet somebody to like kick off this relationship. So there were, there were two things that he did that were really, really interesting. And I think these would be principles that really anybody could take away. One of them he was already doing, we helped him put technology and systems behind it so he could scale it. And eventually that whole thing, turned into a whole separate business that he coached other dentists that he spun up, ran, and then eventually sold. Like in the last 12 months, he sold it. And what it was is uh, he would do, um, he called it virtual smile consults. So he would do a virtual consult. So somebody would come and without them having to go into the office to acknowledge and show somebody face-to-face -face that like their teeth are jacked up and they want to get changed, 
they would they would fill out this form to request a consult. They would send in pictures of their teeth, and he had this. Uh, he would basically take it and he would do like a, a like a mock up or like a like a demo of like, well, here's what it can look like. Here's what we can do, and then he'd do a little video recording over the top of it and then send it back. Um, and so he was doing that kind of, it's kind of a manual process. So we helped him really streamline it. The whole thing, the whole thing was systematized, structured down to the and that's free, and that's free. Yeah, that's totally free. To do like the, the the whole process, we totally systematized it, um, and then what we did is we added in some pieces um, where he would actually he would do a little bit more intentional introduction of himself and the practice. And the whole point of this is before these people ever got into the office, we wanted them to feel like they already knew him. And so the way it would work is they take pictures. His assistant would take those pictures and basically drop them into like a pre built uh, copy of like a Google Slides template that was his little prezo he was going to do. He would do the, 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 the word, I can't get the word right. It's not a mock-up. He would do like, I'm thinking software. Like a terms. rendering or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like right? a rendering. There we go. Yeah, you do like a rendering. Like, hey, here's what it's going to look like. So they could actually see the difference. But, but in the in this presentation, he's like introducing, you know, the company and what they stand for and what they believe in, uh, which, which is all about getting somebody to start to trust him more and to feel like they already knew him. So that, so that would happen. And then once they go through that, the next step is like, hey, so do you want to come meet in person? Um, and that that in and of itself, uh, again, his idea, we didn't come up with that idea. It was his idea. We have since replicated it in other uh, in other industries, uh, but it was his idea. We just streamlined it. That in and of itself made a massive difference when somebody came in to have a conversation about buying. It's like, oh, yeah, I already like I already know you like you told you told me before we got on that you had just gone down the rabbit hole of Brad Martino videos uh, and research. So my guess is right now you're like, I feel like I kind of know that dude. Like I've got him, like I've got him a little bit more figured out. Um, so he was just proactively creating that for his prospects. Um, the next thing that we did for him um, that, uh, that, that helped cement or really even increase the conversion percentages. We're like, okay, listen, when people come into your office and he did this for cosmetic and then also for the family uh, dentistry side, when people come into your office, uh, they've never been there. And I'm not talking about someone coming back for a cleaning. I'm talking about the new clients that I'm trying to sign up the first time. They've never been there. And I don't know if you've ever done this before, but if you ever watch people when they're going somewhere for the first time, uh, it's kind of hard to replicate this because you never know if someone's going somewhere for the first time. But I had a chance at an event. This was a theory of mine. I had a chance to validate an event. So we're at an event and uh, and I was speaking at the event, but I had some downtime. And I was, so I just went and I'm sitting like there's the, you know, typically event, you have like the main hallway that people walk along. And then there's the main room over here. And there's this one hallway. The bathrooms were in a really weird place. Like you had to go down this hallway. But when you look down the hallway, it didn't look like, it looked like a dead end, but it like turned like this and then turned like this to get back to the bathrooms. So they would ask people, where are the bathrooms? And I, this was this spot. I just wanted to like let my brain process. So I went and I sat in this hallway just to kind of stay away from people. And I'm sitting there watching. And uh, I would see people come and you could tell they knew that the bathroom was supposed to be at the end of this hall. So they would come and they'd walk. And, and usually when they turn the corner, you know, heads down, they're on their phone. They're like, I know where I'm going. Then they look up and then you see them literally start to slow down. Like you can imagine this on a movie. It's like they slow down, look around, look back, take one more step. And then they'd leave. This is like a 20 foot hallway and they wouldn't make it 10 feet before they'd stop and they'd leave and they'd go back. So the reason why I share that story and the reason why it's really, really important is for anyone that's doing uh, any sort of, I'm going to meet you for the first time, especially if they're coming into a physical location. Um, we said, look, they don't know what your building looks like. They don't know where to come in. And every person that's ever gone somewhere for the first time knows what they do. They Now, especially with phones, they get there, look at their phone. They walk up like, I think this is it. I'm going to double check my phone and make sure this thing. Like we're deathly afraid of going to the wrong place, even though there's not a soul that's paying attention and nobody cares. But we're deathly afraid. That is not the environment that you want somebody to come in when they're considering dropping some money with you. So what we did is we had him start outside of his office. And we've done the same thing with our stuff. You start outside the office. And you're like, hey, welcome. We're excited to have you come for the first time. Video is like, you're probably going to come in from over here. So if there's a parking lot. Like, I'm going to show you the parking lot. You're going to come right here. Uh, we come here every day, but this is probably your first time. So let me just show you where it is. Look, right here, you'll see this sign right here. You're going to walk through the door. And then you're going to see this person sitting right here. And they're going to greet you. They're going to ask you if you want some water. And then they're going to sit you down right here in this chair while you wait. And then once we're ready, we'll take you back here and you literally give them a tour. So the, the first piece of that virtual smile consult was, let me get you to know and feel comfortable with the dentist. 
The second part was, let me get you to, to know and feel comfortable with the environment. And in that case, it was a physical environment. Um, and between those two things, I forget the specific numbers, but between those two things, uh, what happened is like people had already decided to buy by the time they were sitting down in the chair. Like his conversion rates, it was is ridiculous um, with the conversion rates. And then for anybody else, like the ability to uh, make a, a a very easy way for people to get some initial information, like that initial rendering or whatever. But then also the let me let me introduce the company and myself and and where we're going to be before you ever get there, so that when you get on the call, I'm not fighting you making sense or getting your bearings and then understanding what you understand to then be able to decide like you're like oh yeah i recognize this i know where we are like i got it we're here even if it's virtually it's like oh yeah i'm already okay i got it i know you're here you're there whatever like it makes sense i already feel kind of like i'm home like i'm revisiting a place so th those were those were a couple of the of, of the big things that we did that had a really big impact um for him on conversion rates and then also retention because you've got people that are like i like i know these people I have a connection to them rather than just like, oh yeah, I knew that I needed that thing done on my my teeth, and this guy's a dentist, and dentists do teeth, so I guess I'm here. I don't want to go to another dentist, so yeah, you can do it. But there's no like personal, there's no personal connection, right? So those were a couple of things we did with the dentist that that I think have really good application, really for anybody else that's in that similar kind of we got to have a sales conversation, meet type of a thing. So, so Brett, how did he end up then rolling this out? Because he ended up spinning this into a different business. It sounds like. Uh, so the yeah the virtual smile consult part he did and that was the that was the thing that got sold. Um, so he took that whole system um, of of how to capture the lead that's requesting a virtual smile, the process of how then you create the rendering and and like what to say and what to send back. He actually built some software that was specifically designed to handle that part of the process, and then went to other dentists and like, look, do you want to make it so you can do way more consults for your high dollar high profit procedures? and get the people that are likely to buy to be way more willing to buy because they already know you, then here's how you do it. Uh, so they would install that system. And then um, and then he had a mastermind component that was built onto it as well, where he would do some coaching around like like dentistry, and, you know, in general and stuff. So they built that up. And I don't even know who came along and, and bought it. And somebody bought it, though. So Does someone, a company, have to have a certain technology to work with you? I want to talk about the evolution of your services um, and I know, obviously, it started off because of Infusionsoft, now Keep, and you basically map everything out within there. I don't know if that really is a limiting factor or it matters or not, like if they use something else. No, it it, it did. It doesn't, it doesn't now. It, and it did maybe for the first year or two. And then we're like, okay, the other tools are going to come out. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to simplify what it takes for um, – for the entrepreneur that, that that really like our target, target, target sweet spot typically is the entrepreneur that's that's going through the six figure to multiple six figure range into the maybe into the seven figure, multiple seven figure range. Um, the people we work with, we have clients that are in the in the like higher multiple seven figures and eight figures. They're usually the ones that are like, OK, we blew up, but our processes are crap. So we got to go back and get that stuff. We got to go back and get that stuff handled. Um, and, and the reality is it's the process that you have to go through as a business to make your client journey be automatic. And there's a there's a ton of different software tools, and um, you pick the one. Uh, we tell people uh, we talk a lot about you don't go buy a tool and then ask what the tool does. You get really clear what you're trying to make happen in your business, then you go buy the best tool for the job. So the the tool that you use, whether it's Keep, whether it's Active Campaign, whether it's HubSpot, whether it's High Level, uh, I could go down the list. Of, you know, it's Drip, it's whatever. They're all automation platforms. They're all designed to help you execute a more consistent client journey. Uh, and what we found is the biggest and first hurdle to being successful with software in your funnels and in your client journey is not, never has been, and never will be the software. Which one you choose or how good or bad you think that particular software is, that is not the limiting factor. The limiting factor is always your clarity about what you should be doing and then your process about how you get things done in a systematic fashion. So uh, no, the, the software tool, the software tool doesn't matter. In fact, we have a handful of clients at any given time where we're not actually even implementing. We've done stuff even up with like, well, people that are like, hey, I've got Marketo and I've got Salesforce. Great. We're not going to implement that. But if you have someone to implement, we'll help you get clear about what you should do and then plan it. And then we can help oversee the implementation because that's actually where the value, actually where the value is, is to organize your thinking and then systematize your implementation. You have those two things down where you can handle 
any problem that comes to you without getting overwhelming or without getting overwhelmed. And then you have a system of how to go implement something once you've greenlit it as it needs to be implemented. I don't really care what software tool you have. It's like, then you just go find someone that knows the software tool. And you mentioned clients do say that to you a lot. You helped me organize my thinking. Um, what did you do with uh, Dave Ramsey's team? Yeah, so we had, uh, it was the Entree Leadership Group. So Dave Ramsey's impact. <laughs> Dave Ramsey's empire is like several different uh, different groups. And so we worked with their Entree Leadership Group, which is uh, the group that helps entrepreneurs with leadership and systems in their business. Uh, that, was, that was the whole thing that they did. And at the time, the entire business line was, uh, my, my details on this are a little bit fuzzy because it was a while ago. So if anybody goes and fact checks this, know that my numbers might be off, but the basic concept is right, okay? So I want to say they had two or three events a year. They had, they had a single thing they sold. It was a $300 a month membership. Um, and I think you signed up for the year and they were trying to end isolation. So their whole membership was get entrepreneurs together, create these little like micro mastermind groups. And then they would come together a couple of times a year. And when they would come to, so when they would do their events throughout the year, it was to get clients. So they really had like two or three, and maybe it was four times a year where they would sign people up into the membership. And they're like, all right, we got to figure out um, you know, we got to figure out a, a better way to do this. So they they wanted to launch a webinar where they could, and this was, again, this was way back in the day. So like now webinars, like there's a million different platforms to run it. Uh, there weren't as many back then. Uh, they were using some Adobe something or other, which even then it was like, Adobe, what are you talking about? Um, and they couldn't figure out how to get the, the webinar to go. They couldn't really, they didn't really have hardly any registrations, like almost no conversions. Um, and then, uh, and I wish I had the numbers because these numbers were ridiculous. It went from like, they had one sign up in an entire year outside of their events to like, they like doubled the number of people that they put into the entire program just through their web. It was like some ridiculous, ridiculous thing. So they had, um, they wanted to launch a webinar to be able to sell people into the membership outside of just the events. Uh, they were having trouble actually executing the webinar. And then also they were uh, like technically just like organizing all the pieces uh, and what to do on the webinar, what the pitch was like. And then also, um, they weren't getting very many people to register. But Dave Ramsey had this podcast, like he's on all the time. So when we went to him, we said, okay, look, first off, let's get your system dialed in to where we've got the webinar, we've got your offer, we got the follow-up. So we built the whole system around, like, let's make that thing just churn so we can actually, like, once people get into that webinar, they're going to get followed up. We're going to make offers. We're going to get them to buy. And then let's do a client onboarding so that people understand what they're signing up into so they don't just churn out the back end. So those were two, two big levers is systematize your sales machine and then systematize your client onboarding machine, which, by the way, if you were paying attention to the dentist one, it's the exact same thing that we did on that side, too. Um, and then we said, look, you got this podcast over here. You should just take one of your resources you have. Let's make that be something people can opt in for that will be a tie-in into this webinar and then just start to mention it at the end of your podcast. Like basically become your own sponsor on your podcast and be like, hey, if you want this, so whatever you're talking about, if you want this thing, just text in. So we built this thing where somebody could just text in after listening. They didn't have to get on their computer. They text in, became a lead. They pushed them to the webinar. The webinar sold them into this thing. And they went from like, it was, I, I almost, I almost want to go look up the numbers. It was one of those like, holy cow. It completely transformed. Um, it completely transformed how quickly they were putting people into the membership. And then also like people's satisfaction and the value they got out of the membership because of how they did their onboarding. So I should, I tend to talk fast when I get excited. Let me just call out. There were three things that I mentioned that I think are important. Number one, after somebody bought, we scripted the ideal onboarding experience so people could be excited and know what to expect. In addition to that, thing number two, we built an airtight webinar system that when people came in, they watch the webinar, we follow up with those that don't attend. When they do, we make the offer, that whole thing. And then the third thing is we used their uh, podcast to get people into uh, the webinar system. And so they didn't have to go spend any new money. Um, they just like, it just started, to, They we connected the assets that they already had in place so that they all worked together and they leveraged each other. And, and a lot of times with entrepreneurs, that's one of the first things we recognize is like, well, you got this thing going on over here. And you're trying to do like a sales call here. And then you got this thing going on over here, but none of them talk to each other. We should make this be cohesive. Like let's make it a client journey, not just a bunch of disparate kind of broken funnel pieces. Let's actually string this whole thing together. Um, so that was great. Like the revenue numbers were great. And and we we ran into them, I don't know, it was several years after we ran into some of their team members. We were talking with them. And, and one of the comments they said, 
uh, was exactly what you said. In fact, I think what it was is they came back into town a couple of years later and they're like, hey, you guys in town were like, yeah, we got clients. We should come out. We're going to go into the top golf. We're hanging out. And it was just like, you know, what was like, so catch us up. He's like, you know, the, so we talked about all the things and that, that like they had done and the progress. And then, and then he said, you know, the most valuable thing though, like, oh, that's great. But the most valuable thing is that you organized how we think about what it is that we're doing. Because that's the asset, the organization of thinking is the asset that allows me to now go address any additional problem, challenge, or opportunity moving forward in a much more effective and efficient manner without having to get uh, without having to get overwhelmed. So, um, so anyway, that was the that was the uh, Dave Ramsey. That, that's what we did, and then that was sort of the outcome with the Dave love Ramsey. that, love that. Thanks for sharing that, Brad. Yeah. I want to talk about what you do a little bit, and you mentioned out of one of the lessons, um, you had the wrong business model, but um, talk about the evolution of your services, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up here um, where we have your programs uh, right here. So if you're looking at the video part, um, I have watched this, three ways we can help. Um, and they have the Academy, the Lab, and the Master Builder Program, okay? Um, what was the mistake with the business model? So, okay. Um, the mistake with the business model will not directly correlate to what's what you're showing Got on it. the screen, those three things. But, okay. I'll, but I'll tell the story. And I think I think the... I'll tell the story and then and then maybe we'll get into like what we're looking at doing moving forward, just so it's not like, oh, like I don't want to set I don't want to set somebody's sights on what we did when we're looking at potentially, you know, reconsidering some stuff. So um the when we started, we sold one thing. This was what uh, Andrew came out for. It was called the makeover. And the makeover oh, was the makeover. Can, okay. Yeah. You so and we don't it's not called that anymore. We don't offer that as a standalone up front. And I'll 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 tell why. So when we started, um we actually initially started trying to sell something almost similar to what these three were. And I mean, initially we went to our very first event and we sold nothing of the first two, but I was speaking at night uh, and I was going to sell this makeover and we we're going to charge, you know, I don't know, six grand or something for it. And it was like, look, we know this better than anybody, which is true because I was the one that designed all the feet. Like I knew the software tool better than anybody at that point. So come spend two days with us. We'll get more done than you'll ever get done anywhere else in that amount of time. And it was called the makeover. So we sold a ton of those that night. And there's a whole other story about like not having any money in bank accounts and all of that, that if you listen to any of my other podcasts, you probably heard that story at some point, but it was, uh, that was sort of a, a pivotal, not sort of, that was a very pivotal moment in the history of Sixth Division. Um, so we had the makeover and we we sold a bunch of those. We scheduled them out. We kept selling those. And for the first um, probably two to three years, that's all we did is we sold a bunch of makeovers. We delivered them and we would have, uh, we had five or six, uh, coaches that were on our team. So we'd have five or six businesses come to the office at the same time. Um, but they'd all work with somebody one on one. And then we'd send them off on their way. We got better over time at sending them off on their way and be like, now we're done because you know you can't let your projects have a tail and continue to spill over. Uh, and then we and then we're like, hey, you know, we should probably start to do like people wanted additional help. And initially if they wanted additional help, we just said you got to come back and do another makeover. Um, and then it made there was a time where it made sense and it was probably too late not too late but it was later than it could have been that it was like hey we should just offer that we'll work with people on an ongoing basis if they've done this upfront makeover because we're on the same page we've got we understand your business really really well so we added a thing called the elite 100 which is now called the master builder program which in the very near future will just be called the agency just cuz i like the and one word as the naming of almost everything and this one kind of slipped through but um so we added this um, this ongoing component, but the way we sold it, because our, so this is where the business model stuff starts to come into play. Uh, you build a business one way when your sole thing that you sell is a 6,000 or 7,500 or $10,000 service that is delivered. We were typically six to eight weeks out. We would sell them, deliver them, and they're done. You build a team for that model. It looks very different than the team that you build to fill up uh Recurring revenue program clients. I'm not going to use the word retainer. I don't want to. I don't want to put too many tangents we could have, but it's not a retainer. That's the worst thing you can do as an agency. Recurring revenue clients. So we added this recurring revenue program. the The problem with that is like, well, do I do I incentivize with the commission the sales rep on the recurring revenue program? And if I do, how long do I do that? Do I do it every single month? At, at one point, at what point does it flip to the coach? Um, and if we start stacking up these recurring revenue clients, then that starts to take away from the number of makeovers that we can do, which now decreases the commissionable opportunity for the sales rep on the front end, unless 
I'm starting to add a bunch of coaches. The problem is, is a coach handles, you know, whatever the number of clients is that they handle. And so then you've got to balance the model of, well, when do I go higher? And so for us, what happened is we tried to push the gas pedal on a business model that was based on selling one-time services while we started to add this recurring revenue. And the reality is, ultimately, if I fast forward, ultimately what we came to is, look, the business that I want as an owner, my business partner is, I want one where recurring revenue is greater than recurring expenses, period. And I'll take less money for it. See back to the return that we talked about at the beginning of this call. I'll take less money for it. I want recurring revenue to be greater than recurring expenses so that I don't have to wake up at the beginning of the month and be like, what am I going to go kill this month? And again, there's a lot more details that if we had more time, we could get into because that was my life for like three years of traveling and speaking and it was, it was crappy. So we're trying to push a business model that doesn't actually align with what we want. And part of it is because I didn't know what we wanted at the time. Uh, and also we're on, a, we're on a path for, we are going to create something where our sales rep is going to be dissatisfied uh, because they don't have the ability to sell. And then their incentives are no longer aligned with our incentives. So the first cycle through that um, was that, and then also it created some weirdness for clients too, because we sell them into this two day makeover, they'd come out and then we'd let them decide at the end if they wanted to continue going. But like when you're done with the makeover, like your, your business hasn't actually absorbed anything we just did in two days. And I'm really confident now, like I can out implement in a half a day, I can implement more than your business can. Your business will need like a month or two to digest it and use it. So they're like, well, I got all this stuff done, but we haven't used it. So I'm going to start paying you right now for a monthly fee to go do more stuff, but we haven't actually done this. And I don't really want to just pay more money just for us to start using the stuff that we implemented. So it was a little bit weird for them. And it was hard to predict for us because we were always wondering like, well, I have eight or 10 makeovers coming out in the next six weeks, right? Which of those are going to roll over? And if they roll over, do they affect my ability to sell future make? Like there was a lot of weirdness, the whole, the whole thing. So that was the first mistake. Um, the second mistake was once we got that sorted, we basically, we combined them together. And it was like, no, you're buying into our ongoing program and you start with this up front, but they're not separate. You're you like, we're not interested in, in working with you if all you're trying to do is buy something up front. So that temporarily solved the problem. But the next problem that we failed to plan for uh, was when do we hire people? And so we went and hired people in anticipation of this growth based on some, you know, three month track record prior, like we're going to grow into this, hired a bunch of people. And then the growth didn't like, we didn't, it didn't continue at the same rate, but we were like, we like way, not, I wouldn't say way pre-hired. It was just probably normal with what most agencies would end up doing. It's like, well, I got to go hire to grow. And so we hired first and then it's like, well, now we got to go find the money. And that was exhausting because I'm out. The, the analogy I finally came to is like, it was like I was wearing a double XL shirt and I really fit into a medium. And my solution to solve the problem was that I was going to train three times a day and eat like 6,000 calories a day. And I was going to grow into the shirt. And I, and I remember like, it was kind of laughing, but I was really exhausted and a lot, like a lot overwhelmed at the time in hindsight though. And I laugh at it. Cause like it hit me as I was walking out the building, like, you know what else we could do? I could just go buy a medium sized shirt and we could just write this ship immediately. And all I had, like, I mean, all I had to do, there were some tough decisions in there, but we went from, uh, I, I think when we did that, if I remember right, the numbers, right, we went from like $250,000 in expenses in one month. And we trimmed it back to, this was an in conjunction with recurring revenue greater than recurring expenses. We trimmed it back to like 84.4 within 90 days. And then we built back to where we wanted to be, but it's like, no, we're going to make this thing recurring revenue. And we're going to, we're going to eliminate, like, we're going to go buy a medium shirt. We, we might have in that case bought a small shirt, but I'll tell you what, it felt really good after wearing a double XL. So, <laughs> uh, so that, that was the other one. And then, and then since then, what I've learned is you just, if you're growing based on body, like a, a team member has to serve a certain number of clients. Um, we we built into our model that our current people flex. They carry more than the normal load. They get paid more during that time period. You go get the money first, then you go hire for it. Um, and and you don't have if you can't pause in your business and just like flatline and not always if you're always always have to be growing for your business to work. That is literally the definition of robbing Peter to pay Paul. So it's like you no, know, we'll sit here and incrementally grow up, and then we can go hire somebody else, and then we'll grow up. It's like just let it run. So that was, that was the, uh, that, anyway, that was a couple of the iterations of the business model problem. And then you mentioned where you are going now. 
Yeah. So, okay. So that goes back to what you brought up. So, so right now, kind of where we ended up, and this is the traditional, I feel like traditional, like if you just listen to gurus and what seems to make sense, like I got my agency, I got my services, I'm cranking on that. I should create like a group model where I do some group coaching with people. Um, and then I should create like a course and I could just sell it online and it'll scale and be ridiculous. Like all those dudes that make multiple millions of dollars with their online course. Right. And it's funny because if you say it the right way, everybody laughs at it. But when you're at home planning your business, like that's going to be freaking awesome. And the problem that I have, like, and we, we went down that path. So I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm making fun of my, like, we're at the tail end of like, I don't know. I don't know that that's the actual path. Um, that people that people want to go down. There are people that will buy just the instruction manual, 100%. And there are people that just want the coaching. My experience is that when you're an agency, um, if you just teach people how you do what you do, or you just offer group coaching to how like to, to be like, okay, I don't want to hire you, but I want you to coach me on it. Um, it's not just like, uh, and then the floodgates will just, they'll just open up. I don't think that's what most people want. So what we're looking at is, um, we were going to make a big play to like, we're going to grow this lab membership. It's going to be this big community or whatever. Um, and then what we realized, like, no, actually, if we really want to make a difference in helping people have automatic client journeys and be better equipped to build them and maintain them with the tools that are available today, um, I don't need to give you the academy as the thing that I sell. I can actually give you an automatic client journey. Like I, I can take you through a program where when we're done, you have one. And I can do that in mass. Um, where you make a little bit of tweaks, but rather than you spending six weeks with me and I teach you how to, I just teach you how to organize your thinking so that you can custom build this thing from the ground up. The reality is, is you show me a hundred agencies and I'll show you about two different playbooks and they run all hundred agencies. So where, where I think we're probably looking at going is more of an approach of how do we bring, um, how do we bring people in and how do we have them walk out the door with like, we I have checklists. We call them the conversion checklist and sometimes the experience formulas, depending on where we're trying to position them. But I'll tell you exactly what you need to do with a new client to onboard them so that they stick, they're happy, they're easy to work with. Like I know I have exactly the outline, I have the tools and everything already built. I know what to do in a sales process. Um, and that's actually, that will actually make a difference first. And then second, I can also help you learn how to organize your thinking. Um, so I think the approach we're going to go is the lab, rather than it being this thing that we're trying to like, let's just go grow this membership. When you're done working with us one-on-one, -on -one, and a lot of our clients are, because we're not trying to, to like pigeonhole you in, then that's a place you can go to come ask questions because you totally understand our lingo. Um, if you go through the sales process and you get to the end and it's like, ah, no, I just don't think the agency makes sense. It's like, cool, well, you understand how we think, whatever. You can jump in the lab. We'll give you, we'll give you our academy. That's more for, it's like a downsell. It's just a thing that's there. We do everything in the lab for all of our clients that are in the agency, the master builder anyway. So it doesn't cost us anything extra to put people in there, but it's really only for a certain number of people, like it's for the right person. And that's not most people. And then the, uh, the new thing that we're going to want to do moving forward uh, will be less. Here's the Academy um, because our Academy right now is more like, uh, I don't know. It'd be like, let me teach you how to build a car. It's like, no, I'm just going to walk you through the process of actually having the car built. And then I'll, I'll through that, I'm going to teach you how to organize your thinking. And now you've got something actually running in your business where I've given you specific things to do in your business. Your client journey's already been upgraded. It's already been automated. So um, so anyway, that that's the shift is a little bit away from that traditional, like, oh, I'll just do like a group membership and it'll be great. And then I'll sell, I'll sell this course. It'll be great. And what I find is most people from the agency side, the membership, they put a little bit in there and it's exciting at first because it's extra money that doesn't require a person to look at it but it doesn't ever reach like a volume where it's actually worth it. It's like, you might be easier just to go get two new clients over here and you got the same amount of revenue um, rather than having to manage the whole thing. So, uh, so as we look forward, it's more um, how do I, rather than teach them what I know how to do, how do I take what I know how to do and build something for them so that when they walk out at the end of interacting with me, um, they're at the same place they would be if they were in the agency, which is their client journey has been upgraded and is automatic, not they're better educated to then be able to go do the work to make it be that way. So there'll be some, some program, we haven't decided exactly what we're going to call it, but some program that's like, yo, go through this, you kick out the other end and you've got an automatic client journey already done. And then you understand how to think about it in a way that you can hand it off to somebody. You can make tweaks. It's all organized. So we're doing what we do in the academy, but at the same time, you actually end up with a finished product at the end.
Brad, um, <clears throat> I know you have to you have basketball to attend to. I don't know if you have uh, time for one more question, but I do want to point out people should check out um, the website, which we've been showing, sixthdivision.com to learn more. My last question, Brad, is, you know, you've been going, obviously you coach basketball, you've been going to these basketball camps all over the country with these yeah. universities. I'm wondering what is, what's a learning that you've had from maybe one of the coaches um, at one of these camps or one of the top players? Uh, Cause I imagine, you know, there's a lot of, you know, crossover to business life and, and coaching. Um, yeah. So the, the, the first thought that comes to mind, cause the, the first thought that comes to mind that has crossover, cause there's a lot from a basketball standpoint. I was at, I was at KU last week with Kansas and I'm, I'm sitting next to Bill self. I'm like, all right, I got some questions for you from a basketball standpoint. Um, and uh, so, so two things come to mind now, now that I'm thinking about it, one of them is from my conversation, but the first one is this, um, like, I'm a pretty good basketball player. Uh, I, I would say like, if, if you take the, the group of like played in college, I can compete like to the middle of the pack with the people that played in college. Like, and I, and I mean like the middle of so if you're talking, if I get on a court with a bunch of D one people, I know my role, I can shoot and I cannot get the ball turned over, but I'm not going to go try to do a bunch of stuff. If you're going like to the middle of the pack and they're a little bit older, like I can compete in there. You put me with people that haven't played in college and I'll be one of the best players on the floor. Like that's kind of where I sit. Like I've played a bunch. Um, what I, what I never did though, when I was growing up, I didn't know or understand like how to compete. Um, I didn't understand that. Like I could look down the court and see some dudes that looked really athletic and they, you know, they're dunking or they're making every shot in warmups. And in my mind, I'm like, Oh crap. I know that I miss shots sometimes. And then I forget that they also do too. And then I forget how many hours I've spent practicing. And it's like, no, th this is just called competition. Uh, the first time this idea got planted in my head, I was actually in high school, but I didn't get it. It was a Larry Johnson commercial. And I don't know if you remember Larry Johnson. Yeah, of uh, course. Grandmama. Okay, Grandmama, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. So for anyone that, that knows, so Larry Johnson. UNLV gold tooth, if any, it refreshes anyone's yep, memory. Yep, the whole, yep. Yeah, the whole thing. So he did an interview one time and uh, he was talking about playing and they're talking about like, what do you do when you're playing someone that's really good? He's like, it's real simple. Like, I'm good. You're good. I've practiced a lot. You're practiced a lot. Roll the ball. Out. Let's see what happens. And it was the first time in high school, my brain's like, people think like that? Like, I was just always, I was always afraid. So anyway, fast forward. Um, I learned to compete maybe about 24, 25 is when I was like, oh, I could, we can just go, you just go compete and that's it. Um, but at that time, like I was already married. We had, I would be like two or three kids at the time. So like my, it was like pickup ball. It wasn't organized and organized basketball with refs and a clock is very different than pickup ball. So one of the things that I learned, and then I, you know, I started paying attention to like stars in the NBA and in college. And I started going to these camps and I think it was my third year at Kansas. Um, and I scored like I had a tournament where I played really well. And in one game, I scored 30 points in a game. Um, and I remember it's actually wrote it in my journal when I was coming home because it was like it was it was such a breakthrough. And it was uh, it was, oh, I think I get it now. The people that are really good, they don't ever take their foot off the accelerator. The people that get results, they don't ever stop. And this was pre dollar being invented over here. Um, it, you know, me coming up with that. But it was like, they're relentless because what I did in that game, what I did in that tournament is like, there was no, I didn't, it didn't matter what the score was. It didn't matter if we were up. It didn't matter if we were down. It didn't matter who was guarding me or whatever. And it wasn't that I was being selfish and trying to take shots or whatever. It was like, I was in an aggressive attack mode all the time. So that stands out, like that really stands out for me because I think as humans, what we want is we want to go into attack mode and then we want to coast. And the reality is, is that to achieve success and then maintain success, you have to consistently, constantly, you have to be in like a relentless, never ending attack mode. So that's been one big thing. And I've learned, and that's been reiterated as I go back, you know, through different camps, like, oh yeah, that's it. You just have to be go, go, go. The spillover from that, uh, and this would be from like my last camp, this, it was actually two camps ago. The spillover from that is the most important thing you can do is take care of what gives you the drive to be relentless in attack mode? And so for me, what it is, is it's the ability to basically tell the voice inside my head that tells me to stop and want to go take a nap to shut up. So I went to North Carolina this year, played really well, went to Indiana. Uh, and in between there, I went on a three-week humanitarian trip with my son to Belize. So I didn't get to do any exercising or any like training. Go to Indiana. And Indiana... I couldn't compete the way I wanted to because I was, I was out of shape. 
and I wasn't really that bad out of shape, but like I didn't have the, I was out of shape enough that when it came down to the time where I needed to be able to push myself, like I, I, I wasn't there and it made me doubt my ability to push because I'm like, I don't know if I have anything in the reserves. So for the four to six weeks between Indiana and Kansas, I went to my trainer. I'm like, look, we got to do conditioning. And he's got me on this Versa climber thing. And I pushed hard. And so Kansas, like it was, uh, we didn't win the whole thing, but it was back to like, no, I knew that I had done the work to prepare myself in that case, physically to prepare myself to push through being tired so that I could be relentless. And so it's the same thing, like in business, um, the big overarching thing for me would be, what are the elements about yourself that you need to, uh, as David Goggins would say, callous your mind um, so that you can always be in attack mode? Uh, what do you like? It can be the doubt in the mind. Maybe it's a physical thing that you actually just run out of energy to keep going. Maybe you just, you, as soon as something starts to go wrong, you've got a bad habit of making that be way bigger than it is, but it's how do you build and take care of the muscle that allows you, um, that allows you to be relentless and to keep going. So that would be, that's a big one. Brad, I love it. Everyone check out sixdivision.com and more episodes of the podcast, Brad. Thank you so much. Hi, right, you're welcome. Thanks a lot, man. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.